Good evening and welcome. My name is Betty Cruz and I'm the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. It's my honor to be with you tonight and to be part of this important uh, and timely conversation on a diplomatic end to the war in Ukraine. At the Council, we convene and connect people around global issues to build a thriving, competitive, and inclusive Pittsburgh. Ultimately, our vision is to create a globally minded and globally connected world that is equitable and just for all. So not a small feat and it's gonna take all of us. Tonight's program is part of the 2023 JT Ryan Jr. Memorial Lecture Series presented by the John T. Ryan Memorial Fund. So stick with us and we have a couple of other exciting programs taking shape this fall. When we began shaping this program, the opportunity to make it a friendly debate arose. And at first I was stumped on who would fit this role. So mulling it over, it came to me, what suddenly felt like an instant. I'm like, who's the person who I most love getting into friendly debates with? David Hickson. <laughs> um, and it, I've had the chance to know David for almost 10 years now. I was reflecting on this, can you believe that? And um, David served as U.S. Attorney from 2010 through 2016, and in 2017, he actually founded the University of Pittsburgh's Institute for Cyber Law, Policy, and Security. So his breadth of work, we initially came together on a, on a case around immigration, and um, his breadth of work is, is just phenomenal. So Dave is also not only an incredible resource as it relates to global issues, he's a friend, and he's a new member of our board of directors. Uh, so we're, we're delighted to, to have David leading this conversation today. And before passing the mic over to him so that he can jump into conversation with our special guest, George Beebe, who's director of grand strategy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, I want to recognize a few of George's colleagues who are also in the audience. Uh, we have CEO Laura Lumpy. If you can just wave, Laura. Yeah, great, thank you. Senior Advisor, Eli Clifton, and Outreach Coordinator, Tori Bateman. Thank you all for being here, coming in from DC. Tori, you're out here somewhere as well. There you are, great. <laughs> Thank you so much for your partnership. And partnerships really are at the heart of the, wor of the work that we're doing here at the Council. Uh, we can't get that vision, we can't build this more globally minded, globally co uh, connected world without partners. So I wanna also thank our friends at Global Pittsburgh and the Jewish Family and Community Services who are co-hosting tonight's program with us. Please make sure you check out both of those organizations if you're not familiar and wanna get involved and um, lend some support to build this more globally minded community. Finally, another important aspect of how we are transforming our programming at the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh is to continuously remember that there are people behind the policies we're here to discuss. So that's why we're also very thankful to be in partnership with Marini R. Staub, who captured the images that you see around the room. Uh, she went to Ukraine as soon as the invasion began and has been back multiple times since February 2022. She actually just returned from another trip uh, this week. So if you haven't yet, please take a moment after and make your way through the, through the room, see the captions of the stories of these faces and these scenes that are a part, powerful reminder of, of what's at stake. With that, it's my honor to turn it over to David Hickson to take it away. Thank you, David. Thank you, Betty, and thanks to all of you for coming out this evening, and a special thanks to the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh for always, for many years, decades now, uh, being the platform to sponsor some of the most exciting conversations and timely topics in our region. Uh, George, I want to give you first the opportunity to tell everybody a little bit about you, but first I wanted to welcome you to Pittsburgh. Thank you for your many years of distinguished service to our country and tell you that by the power vested in me, I hereby declare you to be a patriot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, David. Thank you for the, uh, the invitation uh, from the World Affairs Council. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. This is a great turnout. Uh, I obviously view what's going on in Ukraine as a matter of quite critical importance in the world, and I take it that you all agree or you wouldn't be here tonight, so thank you. 
George, let's just jump right in because we want to leave plenty of time for audience questions. Why don't you give us first your assessment of where we are right now in the conflict in Ukraine? Well, um, I will uh, cite Ukrainian President Zelensky on this. Uh, he, of course, gave an address uh, to the United Nations General Assembly today. And he said that the war is really in its third phase. Um, the initial phase, of course, was Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine. Um, that didn't go very well. I don't need to belabor what happened there, but uh, Russia's initial war aims uh, were obviously wildly over-optimistic, and uh, shortly after the invasion began, Russia had to pivot from an attempt to try to seize Kiev uh, to, to capture the vast bulk of Ukrainian territory and put in place essentially a puppet government uh, in Kiev that would resubordinate Ukraine uh, to uh, Moscow. Uh, that all failed and Russia uh, had to adjust to a new phase of the war, which was essentially attempting to take full control of the Donbass region where Russia had uh, announced an annexation um, that in fact exceeded where Russian military forces were actually occupying. Uh, and so uh, since sometime uh, late last spring, uh, Russia has been engaged in this effort to consolidate its control over areas that it has annexed but doesn't yet uh, occupy militarily. Um, now, Following that uh, change in, in Russia's uh, approach to the war, the Ukrainians also pivoted. Um, uh, they became convinced, I think with American encouragement, that the best way to end this war was to go on offense, uh, to capital, capitalize on their early success in repelling the Russian invasion, and drive Russian forces off of all Ukrainian territory, which would include uh, parts of the Donbass that the Russians uh, militarily occupy, as well as Crimea, which the Russians annexed in 2014. Um, the uh, Ukrainians had some uh, early success in this offensive. Uh, they managed to make a lot of progress late last summer and early last fall, drive the Russians back uh, reconquer territory that the Russians had occupied early in the war. And then the Ukrainians prepared for what they called the counteroffensive, um, which the aim of which was uh, to sever the land bridge that connects the Russian Federation proper to the Crimean Peninsula. And the hope was that this would force the Russians to concede that uh, the war had been a failure. Um, and either they would withdraw entirely uh, and capitulate, or they would be forced to sue for peace at the negotiating table, and Ukraine would be in a very strong bargaining position there. Unfortunately, that counteroffensive is not gone as hoped. Uh, the Ukrainians have made some progress, but uh, it seems to me that that progress is more incremental uh, than a breakthrough as uh, had been hoped. So we're entering a new phase of the war that looks like uh, a war of attrition that could be prolonged for quite some time. Um, the Russians are clearly preparing for a long war of attrition. They're mobilizing Russian society, gearing up Russia's military industry, uh, making some economic adjustments that will allow them to sustain this war for a long time to come. And I think Ukraine also is preparing for this as part of the purpose of President Zelensky's visit to the United States to ensure that Ukraine has the wherewithal, both economically and militarily, to sustain this war for a long time to come. So I think that's essentially where we are right now. Do you credit the uh, support of the United States and the Western allies, along with the, the heroism of the Ukrainian people, with uh, being responsible for the failure of Russia during phase one? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, I think a um, couple of factors w 
uh, were pivotal in that early effort. Uh, one was the Russians uh, didn't count on the kind of technological and intelligence support that the United States was able to offer Ukraine. Um, that meant that Ukraine knew in advance where the Russians were going to be striking. They were able to prepare for what was coming at them. And they were able to use technology to identify where the Russian forces were in real time and to respond to them in near real time. Um, now, part of that was, uh, to, uh, to simplify this, um, Elon Musk's Starlink uh, technology, uh, something that didn't get a lot of attention in media uh, accounts of the war, but is nonetheless public information, was that Russian hackers, uh, shortly after the invasion began, uh, were able to blind Ukraine, essentially, by severing their links to communication satellites on which they depended not only for information on what was going on in the battlefield, but also for communication between Ukrainian forces, and even such basic things as banking systems, you know, being able to go to a store and use credit uh, at point of sale. Those sorts of things all depended on the satellite uh, connection for Ukraine. Um, and the Russians were able to hack into that and deny it. Well, that left Ukraine in a particularly perilous situation. In comes Elon Musk with Starlink and says, I have a solution, and was able to provide Ukraine astonishingly quickly with access to satellite technology that enabled Ukraine to do all of these things, to detect what was going on in the battlefield, to communicate within uh, the Ukrainian military in secure ways, um, and to take advantage of this uh, reconnaissance, targeting, and response uh, nexus in ways that proved quite devastating to the Russians on the battlefield. So the combination of intelligence, uh, satellite communications, and then after a little bit of a lag, the United States government said, aha, the Ukrainians are not going to collapse within days and we really ramped up our military support. The weapons that we were able to provide them also arrived uh, very expeditiously. All of that, I think, was instrumental in uh, helping to repel the initial Russian invasion. And, and in talking about uh, phase three, the counteroffensive, we're roughly 60 days into that right now, right? Um, it began uh, the beginning of June. Okay, so a couple months. Uh, what would be the, the course that you see in terms of how this war might escalate or how this war could end uh, as we look at phase three? Uh, well, um, it's pretty clear to me at this time that uh, it's unlikely that the Ukrainians are going to achieve a breakthrough against the Russians anytime soon. Um, and that means the strategy for victory, you know, which is a breakthrough that forces the Russians to say uncle uh, in some form, um, is not gonna materialize um, this fall, probably not next spring. Um, so Ukraine is in for a prolonged fight. Now, how might that go? Um, one of the dangers is what happened uh, during World War II, when the Russians, the Soviet Red Army, was facing the Nazis. Um, the Nazis uh, essentially punched themselves out against Soviet defenses. The Soviet Red Army got better and better as that war uh, dragged on at playing defense. Um, Hitler became more and more impatient for a breakthrough, and uh, the Nazi Wehrmacht uh, so exhausted itself in attempting to break through uh, Soviet defenses that eventually they became vulnerable to a counterattack. Um, and uh, the Red Army was able to counterattack against the Nazis uh, 
and they didn't end until they arrived in Berlin. Uh, one of the things that we have to be concerned about, I think, is that the Ukrainians in this counteroffensive effort will so exhaust themselves, and I think the biggest vulnerability they have is manpower, quite honestly, um, that they could become vulnerable to a Russian counter counteroffensive um, that they would be ill prepared to defend against. Now, what happens in a situation like that? Uh, the United States could be in a very difficult position because uh, I think it's highly unlikely that the United States would look at a potential Russian breakthrough and say, oh, well, you know, we did our best, you win some, you lose some, you know, we're just going to have to live with the outcome there. I think the, um, the imperative in Washington would be to do something to prevent the Russians from overrunning Ukraine. And when you, you start talking about that, now you're into an escalation scenario of some kind because we're not just going to be able to deliver a few dozen F-16 fighters and have that turn the tide. To really prevent a breakthrough, we would have to consider some kind of direct involvement. And, and that's, I think, a very dangerous uh, potential scenario. We, we, you and others, uh, in some of your writing and speaking, have argued that we need to have a plan B and talk in terms of a diplomatic solution. Why diplomacy? and why at this particular moment when it seems like we still have the upper hand? Well, I'm not sure we do still have the upper hand. Um, and that, that, of course, is a difficult thing to ascertain. Um, the war in Ukraine uh, is not only what the military calls a kinetic struggle on the battlefield, it's also an information war. Uh, and in the context of an information war, it becomes very difficult for people on the outside to separate fact from allegation. Things that are published for effect rather than things that are published that actually reflect the true state of what's going on in the war, on the battlefield. Um, so that fog of war in Ukraine is a significant problem for, for analysts. And it's not just people on the outside that have this problem. Um, I, I can assure you that people inside our government are wrestling with this same problem too. Um, now, the, the difficulty uh, assessing who has the upper hand is Ukraine has tried to turn this war into what you might call a war of maneuver. Um, they don't want this war to be prolonged. In, in a war of attrition, they have significant disadvantages. It's a much smaller country. Their population uh, before the war was probably at best you know, a, a third of what Russia's was. Uh, and Ukraine has lost a lot of people, primarily to emigration, people who are fleeing the fighting. The war is taking place on Ukrainian territory. That's a significant disadvantage. So a lot of people have left for safety, quite understandably so. Um, but that also means that Ukraine may have 30 million people left. The Russians have 145 million people. Um, in a war of attrition, that's a very severe disadvantage. Uh, Ukraine also does not have the uh, manufacturing capabilities that Russia does. Uh, Ukraine has been churning through stockpiles of, of uh, arms, munitions, equipment that it had largely from the Soviet period. Uh, a lot of that is gone. So they're having to make a transition from that Soviet uh, equipment and ammunition into Western uh, arms and ammunition. The problem is um, a lot of this equipment is different. You get some tanks from the Germans, some from the Brits, some from the United States each of which requires specific training, each of which requires different maintenance. Um, all of that is a disadvantage in a war of attrition um, because it's more challenging to integrate and use over time. And on top of that, uh, this war has largely become an artillery battle uh, in which um, each side is using enormous uh, quantities of artillery shells. 
on a daily basis. Um, the Russians have a lot more of those artillery shells, um, and they have a manufacturing capability which is much greater than Ukraine's in this area. So, you know, the Russians at the beginning of this war were manufacturing about a million shells a year. Um, the United States at the beginning of this war was manufacturing 14,000 artillery shells per month. But in the last couple of months, Putin has had an internal revolt. It appears he has assassinated the leader of that revolt. Uh, the press is rife with comments that he's destabilized. He appears to have been told by President Xi of China that he's not to use nukes. And it seems to me that sanctions are working. So if you're going to be for a di diplomatic solution, don't, don't you want to have the upper hand and seize the advantage as opposed to go to the bargaining table in a weakened position? Well, I think that's absolutely correct. Anytime you negotiate, you want to negotiate from a position of strength. Right. Um, the question is, is that position strengthening over time? And I would, uh, I would argue uh, at the beginning of this war, the United States felt that economic sanctions on Russia would cripple the Russian economy. It would, as President Biden put it at the time, turn the ruble into rubble. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, the Russian economy uh, was forecast back at the beginning of this invasion to contract somewhere between 15 and 20 percent in GDP on an annual basis. Um, and uh, the ruble was forecast uh, to essentially uh, collapse. Um, and that this pressure economically would cause Russia to say, you know, the, the costs of this invasion greatly outweigh the potential advantages and deterrence would take place. Um, now, a lot of this was premised on some assumptions. One of the assumptions was that the world would join the United States and Europe and Japan and Australia in imposing economic sanctions on Russia, that Russia would become effectively an international pariah state, um, and that the pressure on Russia under these circumstances would be quite considerable. Um, but in fact, what happened was um, the global south, as we term a good portion of the world, um, has not joined in economic sanctions with the West. They've condemned, for the most part, Russia's invasion, uh, but they have not followed through and, and transformed Russia into an international pariah. Um, in fact, uh, countries like India and Turkey have greatly increased their trade with Russia. Um, and as a result, uh, Russia's economy, although it has been hurt to some degree by economic sanctions, actually grew uh, last year in GDP um, and is forecast to grow even more this year. Uh, the ruble, although it recently has lost some value, uh, is, is far from being rubble. Um, so, so are you suggesting we should beat Russia down before we engage in diplomacy? That they have the upper hand? Well, I'm saying that we need to assess um, in a realistic way what cards we have in our hand. Well, what, right would a what would a diplomatic solution look like? How much land would we give to Russia? Would we absolve them of war crimes? Would there be economic consideration paid to them? And what did we learn from their invasion of Crimea 10 years ago? Well, um, on the first question, should we give them land? Um, my answer to that is absolutely not. Uh, the United States should not be in a position where it attempts to bar bargain away some other country's land. That's entirely up to Ukraine to decide. That's a, a matter of bilateral relations between Russia and Ukraine. Um, However, uh, this war has a number of different aspects, one of which is bilateral disputes between Russia and Ukraine over territory, over 
uh, the treatment of Russian-speaking Ukrainians in, in the eastern parts of Ukraine. Um, that's not the business of the United States to get involved in. But there's a bigger aspect to the war, which is geopolitical. It uh, has to do with the shape of Europe's security architecture. And this has been a point of contention between the United States and Moscow since the late Soviet period, in fact, when uh, we were talking to the Soviet leadership at the time about the possibility of Germany reuniting and reuniting as a part of NATO. Um, and Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, then General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party, Boris Yeltsin, uh, his successor as President of Russia, um, and Putin, and Dmitry Medvedev, who was uh, President of Russia from 2008 to 2012, all of them uh, uniformly opposed the eastward expansion of NATO. All of them insisted that there needed to be some new European security architecture that was not NATO-centric, in which Russia had a role. Um, and that is part of what's at dispute in Ukraine right now. Now, Ukraine can't negotiate that issue. It's not up to Ukraine to negotiate with Russia over the shape of Europe's security architecture. Uh, should Ukraine have a voice in that? Absolutely, they are a, a part of Europe. But uh, European states, the EU, have a role in this, and the United States, I think, has a clear role in that. So if we're going to find a solution to this war, I don't believe that solution uh, pivots on the question of territory. Uh, and as you know, there have been a lot of wars throughout history that have ended in some way without resolving territorial status. You know, in Korea today, on the Korean Peninsula, of course, we have a situation where territorial boundaries have not been resolved. North and South Korea have not agreed on uh, the delineation of their borders, but they have stopped fighting. And I, I would argue that that's an, uh, an example of ways that the dangers of war can be mitigated while tabling that question of ultimate agreement on where borders are, are drawn. It seems, though, that our American scholars are divided on whether we need to continue, stay the course. The president also was at the UN today talking about how vital uh, the strategic interest of preserving Ukraine is and that if we let this slide, this is a, just a repeat of what happened with the Sudetenland in Czechoslovakia and we would be embarking on a second Munich agreement. But where, where are we going to go and when are we going to go there and under what circumstances? What would we say to our Ukrainian friends in the room which would directly affect them, not what the map of Europe looks like, but the humanitarian considerations, the, the, the mass graves, mm -hmm. uh, the, the forced emigration from their homeland, the bombs into, uh, into you know, community and non-strategic centers. What, what would we say to them that they must be prepared for if the diplomatic solution is to prevail? Well, um, I think what you're describing uh, is uh, a classic uh, case of uh, right against right. And what I mean by that is it is absolutely a right thing to oppose Russian aggression in this war. Uh, it, that, that invasion was illegal under international law. It was a violation of the United Nations Charter. Uh, the Ukrainians did not attack Russia. They did nothing to force the Russians in any way to invade Ukraine. And Russian conduct in this war, as you point out, is deplorable. Uh, they have, in fact, targeted civilian facilities. They have engaged in numerous instances of murder, of rape, of abuse of uh, individual Ukrainian citizens. And we are absolutely justified and right to oppose all of those things and to insist that they end. 
Um, the problem that we face, though, is that there are other things that we also have to consider in all of this, which are also, quote unquote, right. Um, it is right for us to want Ukraine to come out of this war as a viable, as an intact, uh, thriving country. And when we think about what a prolonged war of attrition might do, we have to consider the likelihood that Ukraine might in fact be destroyed as a result of all of this. And, and we also have to guard against uh, what I would call a moral trap, meaning that um, in our efforts to insist that uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity must be treated as absolutes, that we result, we, we produce a situation in which Russia is incentivized not to end the war. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, if the Russians believe, as I think they do, that one of their key objectives in this war is to make sure that Ukraine does not become a member of the NATO alliance, that the United States cannot use Ukraine as a base for US military facilities that would be, from Russia's perspective, threatening. Um, and we say, well, we're not going to bring Ukraine into NATO during the war, because that would obligate us to actually go to war to, uh, to prevent all these things. But after the war is over, yes, then we can bring Ukraine into NATO. Well, what have we done? I think we have incentivized the Russians to make sure that the war doesn't end, because the end of the war will bring uh, an outcome that they believe is very much threatening to Russian interests. So we have to ask ourselves the question, should we stand on this principle to such an extent that the outcome is that the Russians keep this war going, they make sure that Ukraine is never reconstructed, and they can do that. How? Well, you don't agree to a settlement, first of all, and you keep alive the prospect that any reconstruction effort undertaken this week could be wiped out by Russian missile and bombing strikes next week. Who's gonna invest $500 billion or more knowing that Ukraine and its reconstruction effort is under that kind of threat. So I don't like that situation. I think it's actually quite deplorable that Russia is in a position to deny Ukraine the ability to reconstruct itself and, and have a, a thriving, viable state. The reality is that they are. So how do we deal with a situation where, on the one hand, it's absolutely right for us to defend these principles in Ukraine, but we also have to consider unintended consequences that could be quite damaging, not just to Ukraine, but to the United States and the world. And of course, the ultimate unintended consequence would be a nuclear confrontation between the United States and Russia. And as, as much as I wish that that weren't a reality, we do have to consider that possibility. We're going to move to questions from the audience at this point. And uh... if you can all just join me in thanking David and George for this conversation. <laughs> we have about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so to move through questions. So I'm going to ask if you can kindly raise your hand and uh, ask a question. Uh, so I'm going to start over here where I saw the first hand. And uh, if you can please just make sure that it's a question. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, for this very uh, informative debate, friendly debate. Uh, I have a question. We, I really hate to ask it, and I'm not sure it's leading to the right answer. But you mentioned the DMZ in Korea. In fact, there was no interruption of, uh, well, there was an interruption of the hostilities, but there was no agreement on which territory was which. Would it make sense to simply keep a DMZ where the troops are now and bring Ukraine into NATO? Uh, 
assuming that the Russians do not want a war against NATO, because short of a nuclear exchange, they would lose. Uh, I'm not sure that question makes sense, but I'd be interested in your, in your answer. Well, it's a, it's a good question, uh, a difficult question to answer. Um, and I would um, offer number one, I don't think the Russians would stop fighting um, if we brought Ukraine into NATO. Uh, in fact, I think the danger would be that the Russians not only would continue fighting in order to prevent uh, that from becoming a reality, but I think the United States would face uh, a very difficult choice because the credibility of NATO and the, credi the credibility of America's alliances more generally would now depend to a significant, significant degree on our willingness to go to war with Russia. Now you had mentioned Russia would lose. Um, I would argue both sides would lose. Um, you're in a scenario where um, nobody is going to prevail uh, in an escalatory dynamic that would ultimately end in some kind of nuclear exchange. That's a lose-lose scenario. Um, and if I were back in one of my former government positions uh, writing policy memos, sending up the chain in the White House, I would caution that the United States should not put itself in a position where it might face a choice between humiliation and escalation into a direct conflict with Russia. Um, that's exactly the scenario that John Kennedy warned about after the Cuban Missile Crisis in the speech that he gave at American University, uh, that you should not put yourself or your, your opponents in a position where they face a choice between humiliation and nuclear use. Um, I don't believe that NATO membership is some sort of magic talisman. That is, once we declare it, the Russians would simply not dare to attack us. Um, that's a gamble, a roll of the dice. What if the Russians actually do challenge us? What then do we do? Any responsible policymaker has to consider that possibility. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Olha, and I'm Ukrainian. And George, I have a question for you. Actually, um, some of my friends and member of my family died defending our land, our country, and Russia is bombing our country every day. And I have very simple question to you. Do you believe in negotiation with a terrorist? It's a very simple question. Um, it, it, it seems on the surface to be a very simple question. I, I would argue that in fact it's a very difficult question because um, things that are good things that are in tension with one another are at stake. So uh, let me give you a real world example. Uh, Saddam Hussein, terrible, terrible person guilty of all kinds of atrocities um, toward his own people, toward other people. He used chemical weapons on his own people. He used chemical weapons against Iran. Um, what does the United States do about that, right? Um, there was a belief that um, it was a universal good for the United States to remove him from power militarily everybody would be better off. The Iraqi people would be better off. The region would be better off. The world would be more secure. Things didn't work out that way. Um, there are a lot of unintended consequences that flowed from very good intentions, I would argue. We're dealing with those consequences today. Iraq is not an isolated case. I, I mention all this not to say that Ukraine and Iraq are the same thing. But to point out that in the world of foreign policy, where leaders have to grapple with these kinds of real world decisions, they have to make hard choices between things that are all right things, all good things, 
good to want to prevent aggression in the world. It's good to want to defend human rights. It's good to want to prevent atrocities. But we also have to recognize that there are other good things too. Would it be a good thing for the United States to say we will not negotiate with Russia, we will only win because Russia is the guilty party in all of this and justice must prevail. But the result of that is that the United States and Russia get into a direct military confrontation that threatens everyone's security, including Ukraine's. Is that a trade-off that we wanna make? I would argue no. That's a very serious, very difficult decision that we have to treat with the utmost seriousness. Now, if, if you were to ask me, is there a possibility that we might be able to negotiate an arrangement that would allow Ukraine to survive and prosper? Um, that also would require the United States to concede on something we've not been willing to negotiate, which is NATO enlargement, NATO's continued eastward movement. Would that be a good trade? I would argue yes. I would argue no. <laughs> and what I want to say is that sounds exactly like what Neville Chamberlain said when he came home in 1937 with the Munich Agreement with the full support of the French leadership. I do not dispute that these are difficult problems, but I think that one of the most fundamental lessons of history is if we don't learn from our mistakes of the past, we repeat them. Um, just a quick comment. Um, the comparison of the Ukraine war to appeasement of Nazi Germany in World War II is um, very common in popular discourse. In fact, I think that has been the historical comparison that has driven US policy in dealing with Ukraine so far. Uh, what we've not done is consider the example of another war, World War I. World War I did not happen because of, of appeasement. In fact, it did not happen because some great power decided it would like to invade another great power. It happened because of an escalatory spiral in which every country involved believed it was playing defense against threats posed by other countries. And alliances that entangled these countries dragged the great powers of Europe into a confrontation that nobody wanted. So the question that we have to consider in Ukraine, are we dealing with a World War I problem? Are we dealing with a World War II problem? So we have a lot of questions in the audience. <laughs> One last thing. <laughs> Uh, President Zelensky, in addition to being in New York at the UN, was on 60 Minutes Sunday. Perhaps some of you saw him. And he basically said Putin is playing the long game and he's trying to wait until America is sufficiently divided or perhaps we have our own regime change. Uh, to me, the fundamental question is what is going to be American policy? And the thought exercise I'd ask you all to engage in is pretend Ronald Reagan was president. If we invaded Grenada because we were worried about Soviet influence in Grenada, what would Ronald Reagan do? What would George H.W. Bush do? Or stated another way, is not the Biden policy of creating alliance with all of the allied countries and trying to isolate uh, Putin right out of the playbook of George H.W. Bush? So I'm going to go to an audience question, and I'm sure George, you're going to jump back onto that one. But we have a question here, over here, and then I'm going to move to that side of the room, and then we had the in the front in the green. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Yaroslav. I am also from Ukraine. My family is still in Ukraine. Some of my friends are at the front line. And uh, more than anything in my life, I want this war to end, naturally. But still, I want to ask you a question, how you can make a deal with a person who never, who never fulfilled any deal in his life, who ignored every deal, any treaty, 
everything. How can you know that he will not use this to empower his army and strike Ukraine again? And one more, uh, you mentioned today uh, the speech of Zelensky. I watched this speech in the United Nations today, and he mentioned one guy who recently made a deal with Putin. Uh, his name is Evgeny Prigozhin. And uh, you know his fate. Thank you. Well, um, what's interesting to me about your question, first of all, I, 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 I say I, I uh, sincerely sympathize with the plight of your family, with all Ukrainians that are, that are having to suffer in this war. Um, I think any, anybody uh, feels in his heart uh, the pain that this must involve. Um, now, in terms of negotiating with the Russians, um, this is a point um, that we have dealt with before in our history. You know, it happened during the Cold War. Um, there was a very strong belief among many people in the United States that you couldn't trust the Soviet Union to adhere to any agreements, that they simply were dishonest, um, that they would violate their pledges, um, and as a result, arms control, various other kinds of uh, agreements with them were worse than futile. They were dangerous, uh, that we should not pursue that sort of thing. Now, how did that turn out? Uh, John Kennedy, by the way, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were significant numbers of his advisors that said to him exactly that. And we should not negotiate with the Soviet Union over Cuba. We should actually strike. Um, and Kennedy did not take their advice. He, in fact, negotiated a deal with Khrushchev. Um, and it's a good thing that he, he did negotiate that deal, in my opinion, because we learned later something that we didn't know at the time. Uh, the Russians had tactical nuclear weapons near their missile sites in Cuba. Had we attacked, this war would have gone nuclear. Um, and that would have been, in my view, a complete disaster for the world, for everybody involved. Now, did the Russians keep their word uh, on Cuba? Yes, they did. Did the Soviets comply with arms control that we negotiated with them over the course of the Cold War? I would argue, yes. For the most part, they did. Why? Because of something that Ronald Reagan was famous for advocating. It was you know, an old Russian expression, uh, trust but verify. Um, we did not simply trust that the Soviet Union would, out of goodwill, comply with the agreements that we struck with them. We also verified. And we also set up something that was very much in our interests. And that is, we could trust that the Russians would act in their own self-interest. Not that they would do things out of kindness, out of favors for us, but they would do things that actually advanced their own national interests. When you coupled that with the intelligence capabilities that we had to monitor compliance with these agreements, things tended to work out pretty well. And I would argue that leaving aside whether Putin is a good and trustworthy person, we're still in a situation where we can expect Russia to live up to its own self-interest, and we also have the capability to monitor compliance. So I'm not of the belief that it is futile or counterproductive to try to pursue some sort of understanding that is enforceable and monitorable over time. Uh, first, I want to thank you both for your time today. Uh, you mentioned earlier the Starlink technology uh, that Ukraine is reliant on for communication and a variety of other things. Recently, there's been reports that Elon Musk suspended that technology, thwarting Ukrainian uh, plans to attack a battleship. Uh, 
do you think that Ukraine's current reliance on Starlink technology is sustainable over the course of a longer term war? And what, if anything, do you think the United States should do in order to, uh, to respond to Mr. Musk's interference? <laughs> well, the way you phrase all that is quite interesting. <laughs> um, that was, of course, the initial uh, accusation about what happened here, that um, um, Musk somehow intervened in this war to stop service over Crimean territory that the Ukrainians would have used in an attack on Russian facilities in uh, Crimea. Uh, in fact, uh, what has subsequently come to light was that um, Starlink was never providing service over Crimea, um, that that was territory that was outside of what uh, Starlink was, was offering, um, and that Musk, in fact, uh, has claimed, and I think this is true, that providing that sort of coverage uh, in territory that the Russians claimed um, that would enable an offensive action uh, by the Ukrainians that might have sparked some sort of direct conflict between the United States and Russia was in fact something he would require the White House to approve. Um, so um, was that the right call uh, for Musk? Um, I think that's debatable. I think reasonable people can come to different conclusions on that. But it raises, I think, a very interesting question. Um, we have a situation where a private company is providing services that back in the old days would only have come from the US government. Um, the United States went to, start to, to Musk and said, hey, can you help us launch satellites into space? Why? Well, NASA's own space launch capabilities were atrophying. Um, and so we made a decision um, to outsource a lot of these capabilities to a private company. Well, when you do that, you're gonna lose some control over how those capabilities are used. You're gonna get into a situation where there may be not a perfect overlap between US government, national interests, and the interests of that private organization to whom you have outsourced these capabilities. Is that the situation that we want? Is that a desirable situation for the United States? I think this is something that we need to be debating. I'm unclear about what was Putin's rationale for invading Ukraine. Was, was this a, an attempt, a, a symbolic attempt to start to reassemble the Soviet Union? If he had realized this was not going to be a cakewalk, would he have not done it? Was it simply to demonstrate the power of the Russians? Why did he do it? Well, I think this is something that historians are going to be debating for a long time to come. And, and I think you have laid out some of the, the key schools of thought. Uh, one school of thought is this is basically um, a war of ambition, a war of imperial aggrandizement, an attempt to resubordinate Ukraine to the Russian Empire, rebuild that empire in some way. And NATO enlargement had nothing to do with it. You know, that's an excuse. Know, not an actual motivation for what happened. Um, there is also what you might call the John Mearsheimer School, um, which says this war is completely and totally the fruit of America's insistence on NATO enlargement into an area that we should have known was neuralgic for Russia and would potentially result in exactly the situation that we're in. I personally think that uh, single uh, factor explanations for what happened uh, are inadequate to capture what motivated Putin. I think there were a number of different factors that drove him, some of which were defensive. Yes, I think NATO enlargement and the, the threats that that might pose to Russia uh, as Russia perceived those threats was a very important motivating factor but it was not alone what drove him. 
part of this, I think, is what to Americans seems very paradoxical. Um, Russia believes that it cannot survive as a state unless it is a great power. In other words, the Russians don't believe that they can become like Sweden. Sweden, you know, centuries ago was a great military power. In fact, waged some very significant wars on Russia. Um, was a real powerhouse within Europe. Um, but Sweden uh, shifted and it became, it, it uh, focused rather than being a great military power, it wanted to provide a great standard of living for its people and did so you know, quite impressively. Um, Russia doesn't believe it can do that. Why? Because Russia is a vast, vast geographic expanse. It has few natural geographic barriers to invasion, and simply ruling that expanse is a formidable task. Um, and so in order to secure itself against potential invaders, and in order to keep that country integrated and ruleable, it has to be a great power that radiates influence into its immediate neighborhood. And it believes that all great powers do this. Right? Russia doesn't believe that it's unique in wanting to ensure that its neighbors are at least not hostile to it. The United States wants to ensure that our neighbors are not hostile to us, that they don't pose threats to us, and anybody that doubts that should talk to some Cubans. <laughs> um, so um, there are both offensive and defensive motivations that are difficult to disentangle with Russia and all of this. Now ultimately, I think Putin viewed this as a preemptive war. Uh, he believed that if he didn't act now, that uh, the U.S. Ukrainian military relationship would progress to the point where a year into the future, Ukraine would be so militarily strong that Russia would have no option other than to face this reality that Ukraine was going to become either a de facto or a formal ally of the United States militarily. Um, and he didn't trust us. Why? He was concerned that we were playing for time, that we were talking about some sort of agreement over Ukraine, but at the same time, building up the Ukrainian military, training its forces, refitting port facilities at Nikolaev and Odessa so that they could bring US naval vessels into port. And he looked at this and said, you know, I either act now or these things are going to become a reality in the future. Now, is preemptive war to pre prevent the materialization of an anticipated threat legitimate in international relations? No, it is not. Um, the United States did that in Iraq, right? What was our justification for the war in there? It was an imagined future in which Ukraine might have weapons of mass destruction that it could use against the United States. We weren't willing to live with the possibility that that threat could materialize. We took action to prevent it. That was illegal under international law. It was not authorized by the UN Security Council. My argument is not only was it illegal, but it proved disastrous for everybody involved, including us. Um, Putin has done much the same thing in Ukraine, and one can argue that his perceptions were misperceptions, and I think to some degree they were, um, but that doesn't excuse what he did there. Um, so you know, as an analyst, one of my challenges is I try to understand um, perceptions from the other side. Why? Because if you don't, you're gonna get surprised by things. Right? You, you have to, to the degree that you can, try to walk in the shoes of these adversaries without sympathizing, without saying, you know, that's how they see things and they're right. <laughs>
So in this particular case, I try to understand what's driving the Russians without endorsing those motivations as being right or justified. Okay, so I was told I need the last question. Um, I trained at Gispia with Goldie and Professor Holstner, so I'm on your side. <laughs> but my question is, and it's for both of you, um, if Putin accidentally fell out a window, would the next leader be Putin-like? And do you think he will accidentally fall out a window? Well, one of the few things I can say for certain is that Putin will die at some point. <laughs> um, I cannot forecast the means by which he will, um, he will die. But um, there will be, at some point in Russia, a post-Putin era. Now, um, what's that likely to be like? Um, I think the best case scenario is that we get a technocrat, someone who is not very ideologically driven uh, somebody like current Prime Minister Mishustin, whose job it is to make the trains run on time, you know, to make the Russian government actually function effectively. Um, best case scenario. Um, we're very unlikely to get a Gorbachev type figure, someone who is transformative, who attempts to reform, liberalize the system, uh, put the relationship between Russia and the West on some fundamentally different basis. Why is that? Because the Russians know what happened under Gorbachev and afterwards. And most Russians look at that and say, this is not a good thing. That, that Gorbachev was naive. Uh, he, he made the mistake of trusting the West. Uh, he didn't anticipate all the ways things would go wrong. Um, and the, the primary um, political force in Russia right now, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this is true, is on the political right. It's nationalists, uh, turbo patriots, as the Russians call it, who believe that Putin's been too soft, that he has um, been too eager to find accommodations with the West. Um, they regard him as a Germanist, you know, someone who is, you know, too willing to find accommodation with Angela Merkel. Um, um, and that he fundamentally erred in trying to implement the Minsk II Accord in Ukraine, which these turbo patriots believe was cynically advanced by France and Germany to mask a military buildup in Ukraine preparing for this ultimate war. So that's the part of the Russian military uh, sp political spectrum that is most dynamic, most influential right now. Now, could you know, a, a, a leader emerge from a situation like that that the United States likes a lot better than Putin? Not impossible, but it's not likely. So I wish that we had a Putin problem uh, in Russia. Unfortunately, I think we have more of a Russia problem. I would close by saying this is an area of agreement. I think the prime ministers who, if you look at the long march of history, fits the profile like Putin, like Stalin, who's an insider. When I was an amateur criminologist when I was younger, we always were putting our American lens on it, looking for a dynamic political leader, and that's simply not their system. But it is true that the devil we know might be better than the devil that we, we don't. I would say that one thing that I focus a lot on and has always been striking to me is Russia's power is really as a disruptor. Their economy may be experiencing a resurgence, but they're roughly the size of Italy's economy. They're the 12th. They're not a major power economically. And at some point, the people of Russia, I think, because of the internet and the fact that everything's becoming westernized and this information age instead of machine age, it's going to demand and clamor for, for more. And I don't know how that plays out, because obviously their elections are a farce. So it's going to be dynamic time. George, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Great. I hope all you have. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you, George. Thank you, um, uh, David. Thank you for lending your expertise to us tonight. And thank you all for your generosity. I know we're a bit over time and we didn't get to all of your questions. So please stick around um, and ask our speakers any questions that you have or follow up with us directly. And I'll be happy to uh, get some answers uh, to you from the Quincy Institute. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, please stick with us. We have a bike ride on Saturday uh, connecting folks to global issues specifically as it relates to the Latino um, Hispanic community for Hispanic Heritage Month. And then we have our big soiree uh, fundraiser October 6th, which is a celebration of the world right here in Pittsburgh. Thank you so much. Have a great night.